This podcast is brought to you by Burl Audio. Get it right the first time. Learn more at burlaudio.com. Hey, it's Larry Crane. Welcome to the Tape Op Podcast. Famed producer, musician, and arranger, Willie Mitchell became involved with Royal Studios and the Associated High Records in Memphis, Tennessee in the early 60s. He took more control of the studio operations as time went on, and in the early 70s, his collaboration with singer Al Green led to millions of albums sold, all of which cemented Willie's reputation as a producer of note. These days, his son, Lawrence Boo Mitchell, a musician, songwriter, engineer, and producer in his own right, runs Royal Studios and co-owns Royal Records. He keeps the legacy alive while also looking to the future. Boo's produced and or engineered a wide range of acts, including Melissa Etheridge, Solomon Burke, Al Green, Cody Chestnut, Rod Stewart, John Mayer, Snoop Dogg, Bobby Rush, William Bell, Keb Moe, Terrence Hauer, and Boz Skaggs. I met up with Boo one evening at Royal Studios in the back control room, and we discussed life in the studio. Enjoy. This audio recording was not originally tracked with the intent of using for a podcast. It was recorded solely for transcription for our print interview. Please forgive any balance issues, background sounds, or lack of clarity. Enjoy. Let's see. Let's backtrack <laughs> a lot. Okay. First of all, you grew up and your dad was producing records. Yeah. Like, what are your first early memories of that of that kind of stuff? Uh, I mean, I remember coming to the studio when I was, you know, like real small, probably yeah. four or five, something like yeah. that. Yeah. Did he own Royal at the time? Was uh, it was here. He, uh, you know, he's been here since almost the beginning, since like. 58 or 59. Wow, that long ago, yeah. Yeah, because Royal was actually the second. So you know Royal started out of the Million Dollar Quartet story. Really? Yeah, so when Elvis and Johnny Cash yeah. left Son in, I guess, 55 or something like that, 54, yeah. 55, um, Elvis's bass player, Bill Black, oh, right. was trying to do his own thing and then there was another couple of guys that son one the engineer ray harris mm-hmm. and then the other uh it's like a producer kind of guy named quentin clunch that uh they were trying to do their own thing with yeah. bill and they got local the guy that owned pop tunes record shop joe Kugi, to buy this place all right so that's where high records comes from c-o-u-g-h-i Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> and Coogie like owned all of the jukeboxes in town. Yeah. And he owned the. So anytime you saw Elvis in a record shop in the fifties, it was at Pop Tunes. It was, right. And um, that guy like loved my dad, and my dad had the most famous band in the fifties. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, so that's how he, you know, Pop became one of the, the probably. The, second or third artist signed to high. Right. So anyway, the studio, Joe Coogie died in like 70 and left in his will for my dad to like take over the operations of high records. Right. So it was, it was always, you know, I was born in 71. Mm -hmm. So it was always kind of his, you know. Yeah. Because the other owners, they were they were like never here. I don't think they had offices here. They had offices in Pop Tunes. And right. My dad even had offices. Oh in right, Pop right. Tunes. Um, so my first I started coming out was like four or five, and just really be after the tape machine. I mean the Coke machine. And, uh, <laughs> and I always felt this little magical. Like every time I came down here, you could, I always felt something like it was something enchanted about it. And yeah. I think by the time 
I was about nine. Yeah, like maybe fourth grade. Yeah. Um, I started actually coming down here with Pop, you know, uh, on the weekends or spending my summers down here. Right. And watching him, you know. Were you helping with little tasks and stuff? Yeah. Just like yeah, just simple. whatever little simple yeah. stuff. <laughs> That a nine-year-old could do, yeah. and uh, mostly just yeah, <laughs> mostly just watching him, and because I played keys, so yeah, that would have been God must have been like eighty or something, yeah, and all the cool Moogs were out, oh, and yeah. like the fucking Juno, and the, oh wow, over, you know, the, I was uh, I just wanted to be in the studio. Yeah. all the time <laughs> and watching the you know watching the guys play what was your dad's schedule like back in the day when you're growing up was he, um, did he did he keep a pretty straight schedule here or was he was he doing late nights yeah he pretty much would come to the studio around 10 in the morning mm -hmm. 10 or 11 we'd like stop and get breakfast and get here around 10 or 11 uh and stay until we got it done. Uh, yeah, so this guy, he was, he was pretty strict. Uh, yeah. On on his deal, he you know he would he was always, he's always working, always doing something. And then he would, he would go, uh, to other studios too. Uh, he would like kind of break bread with the. I remember going to this place called Shoe Productions uh, over on Broad. Um, it was uh, Warren Wagner's studio, and I remember going there as a kid, but I didn't really know why until after my dad passed away. I got this nice letter from Warren saying that, man, your dad cut this Christmas album at my studio because we were... And you know, having a hard time, and right. Papa just got some label had just given him a deal to cut this Christmas tree. He was like, "Man, if y'all are struggling, hell, I just cut it over there." <laughs> <laughs> when he could have been here, yeah. yeah. Oh man, so uh, that's pretty yeah. generous. Yeah, you know, he was that. <laughs> he was just that type type of dude. Man. Wow, uh, wow. Then when did you start? You you were playing keyboards. Were you playing in bands and stuff at all? No, I was just uh, playing on my own, and yes. I think I probably I think I wrote my first song when I was about fourteen, uh, and then I think by the time I was six, I started like rapping when I was sixteen, mm -hmm. um, and. That was around the time that Pop first bought first bought a bought us a um, like four track recorder or it may have been a I think the first thing we had was a Tascam four track cassette recorder. Yeah. And then by the time I was seventeen, uh, he bought us like the Fostex eight track cassette. Oh and yeah. We were like. Man, <laughs> he thought we was slicking and goose shit. That's was, pretty awesome that he's got access to a studio. But he's like, here you go. Here, start, here, here's a four track. Like, it, yes. You know, it, learn on your own. It, yeah. <laughs> and it was, uh, it was amazing, man. You know, we start, you know, cut all the stuff. And um, and that's when I, I started working on my rap album when I was 17. Uh, and, and, you know, started messing with you know, messing with the big boards and stuff. Yeah. Um, we moved back here in 89. Uh, the last record we cut upstairs was that Keith Richards' Talk is Cheap. Oh, right. This place was bought in 56, turned to a studio in 57. Right. Um, so from 57 till about 73, the main control room was here with those big green uh voice of the theater yeah. speakers that the actual ones that he mixed all the owl stuff were back there in the pre production room by the bathroom if you oh, went really? to the bathroom. <laughs> uh, so all of this stuff was in here in the old the eight tracks and stuff and then whenever Quadraphonic came out and 
16 track whatever and moved yeah. the studio upstairs and that I've was I've never been upstairs really? yeah you will have to go up oh, there later oh hell yeah it's still you were telling me about it yesterday and I was like yeah upstairs where? <laughs> yeah, yeah man so that's interesting all of my memories were mostly from upstairs. Were both were both uh, studios up running at the same time? Uh, probably only for about a year. I yeah. think by 74, 75, it was all, the, everything had transitioned to being done up there. Right. I mean, this was stuff that was just kind of off and collecting <laughs> dust. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so that's, those are my, you know, where I kind of yeah. got started and then uh in 89 right after we cut that keith record we he wanted to uh you know get a bigger because shit was changing you know he was like okay we're gonna need 24 tracks i think we actually yeah. had the 24 track tape machine maybe by 80s maybe by like 87 80 yeah, yeah. maybe by 87 i think he bought that machine, but it it's put it up, uh -huh, put yeah. it upstairs, and he was like, "Okay, we're gonna need a bigger board, blah blah blah." Cause, yeah. Um, and so when we came back down here, that's when I, you know, got my hands on stuff. Cause hell, I remember I was yeah. here helping them build the fucking room out. You know, I wasn't <laughs> carpentering or nothing, but I was just here doing a little odd, you know. To doing trash or whatever, yeah. you know. Yeah, just how building it. Yeah, just these I remember things. the whole process. Uh, wow. And even putting the board in, this board came from Compass Point. Oh, right. Uh, and wow. I think what sold my dad on the board was, uh, I think it was Randy Blevins in Nashville, mm -hmm. uh, was like, man, the, the, they cut some stone, you know, there was some stones record cut records cut on that board and my dad was like uh yeah i just did keith's new record yeah let me check it <laughs> you know let me check it out that's funny so uh and even when they were installing the board because the time transition was only months yeah keith was calling my dad trying to get him to come to master the record yeah with him and yeah. Pop was like, man, Keith, man, I can't come, man. I'm trying to get my fucking studio. <laughs> I, told, I told you I can't come. I can't do this. <laughs> Working Your dad was a producer. He was not an engineer. As far as I know, right? No, he was. Yes. He was an engineer? Yeah. Was okay. he engineering? Okay, he so. He just said later on he didn't want to engineer? No, he just kind of stopped. The older he got, he had yeah. us. But okay, his first contract was with this company called Home of the Blues Records mm -hmm. in like '58, and this dude named Reuben Cherry owned it, and it was on Beale Street. But they cut their records here, and Ray Harris was the engineer from Sun, yeah. and um, my dad never liked the way his record sounded, right? Right. Okay, <laughs> and. Ray told my dad, you know, black people can't touch the board, you know. Wow. So Pop was like, okay, whatever. And he was cutting stuff and uh, he left Home of the Blues and Joe Cougar signed him to High Records. Mm -hmm. But the first two Willie Mitchell records, like, didn't have his picture on it because Ray and the other guy was like, well, you know, you can't put a black dude, you know, just... Put a nice white lady on it, and then everybody will buy the record. <laughs> I've because, seen some of those covers. Yeah, yeah because I was they, why. yeah, because they like the music. And, oh my um, god! I was so, why they were like that. So this Jesus. this A and R guy from New York was the promotion man for London Records, which was the distributor for mm -hmm. I. He told them, man, if Willie's picture is not on the next record, I'm not working another high record. And his name was Dickie Klein, real good yeah. friend of my dad. And he was a young guy at the time, but he was really good because he had broke. Uh, High Records had a, a, a Jumpin' Gene Simmons haunted house. It was a million seller. Yeah. And this guy had broke that record. Right. And um, and so he had a meeting with Joe Coogan. And Joe was just, Joe owned the record shop. He was looking to Ray and 
Clinton and right. other people to tell him what to do with the record company because he never label. Yeah. ran a label before. Yeah. And so he was like, okay, so put my dad's picture on the next record. Bill Black had this record called Smokey Part Two, mm -hmm. which was his biggest record. Right. But it was a Willie Mitchell record. Oh, really? It was Pop's record with Pop's band, and the record was so good, and Bill was a bigger artist that they put Bill Black's name on it. And I forgot about this story. <laughs> yeah, and Pop was yeah, yeah. pissed, man. And Joe Coogie was like, man, you're just ahead of your time, you know, blah, blah. I didn't even think, because somebody asked me about their record. It was like, we don't hear Bill's bass on it. I'm like, because Bill ain't playing on the fucking record. It's a Willie Mitchell record. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So I think it was sometime around 64 that, Somebody, uh, Ray sent somebody to get some out of his car, Ray Harris, and guy goes, opens his trunk up, and this is old fucking KKK outfit is in his trunk. Mm -hmm. And one of the black musicians was walking by and like saw it. And he was like, what the fuck? Tells my dad, and Pop Man. has a meeting with Joe about Ray. It's like, well, what are we gonna do about Ray? Joe's like, I don't know. And Pop was like, well, let me buy him, buy him out. And uh, so Pop bought him out, and Pop told him, uh, he, he was like, Ray, I learned a lot from you. And Ray's like, what's that, Hoss? And Pop goes, I never cut a record like you cut it. <laughs> <laughs> like it looks because my dad never liked the way his record sounded and he mm -hmm. always would complain and saying well you can't tell the difference between a, a Willie Mitchell record and an Ace Cannon record and a, mm -hmm. you know so once he got Ray out he started uh, experimenting right. him and Bill Cantrell the guy that built probably most of the studios in Memphis right? Um, they just started experimenting with you know putting Hip hop kept adding insulation and bur and burlap, right? Till he got to sound like he wanted, and you can listen to Willie Mitchell instrumentals in order and hear. Really you can hear the sound, man, like dialing in right, to the right. Al Green thing, right? If you listen to Twenty Seventy Five, and then you listen to like uh, Soul Serenade, yeah. Or, or you you know what I mean? Or you yeah. listen to one of those records with the white ladies on them. Yeah. <laughs> and then listen to Soul Serenade, and, which was done like in 67, yeah. you know, came out in 68. You can hear the right. sound just like everything getting quieter and, you know. Like higher and Yeah. Yeah, and focus. <laughs> I always tell people, man, I'm always like, like you can have like a live, like a jazz drummer playing in a room and it sounds like roomy and it's like it's in this space. And then you can have Al Green snare. It's a big, <laughs> thick, deep thing right in your face going... <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know? And they're they're both completely valid. Exactly. You know, it's just a different it's approach. What, what you want at the time. Yeah. And, um, like, all of that design is... That's his doing. Yeah. And he got it like he wanted it in, I think, by 69 was when he, like, perfected it. And then had his tape machine, you know, the tape machine, all two, eight track. Right. So uh, I think Tired of Being Alone is like the first record that has the perfected sound. Because you can even listen to other Al Green records like Al Green Gets Next to You, mm -hmm. um, Can't Get Next to You and all that stuff. Yeah. And the sound is different. But when Tired of Being Alone comes on, it's like, oh, shit, that's <laughs> shit, right? <laughs> That's it, right and there. It really was. You're talking about an era too, where studios were, studios and places were known for a sound. Yeah, and they you were know? going. In most places, yeah. were going the opposite direction. But Pop, yeah. all like everything <laughs> he did, man, he always, even like when he would be working on a record, producing yeah. it, he wouldn't listen to the radio because he didn't want to unconsciously mm -hmm. steal <laughs> shit. But uh, so yeah, he engineered all that shit. Okay. So that's why I learned yeah. most of my engineering from right. is him. But um, it was only when I got old enough, uh, you know, older and smart enough to go, hey, man, how did you do that? 
Because when we first got this, me and my brother, we were doing rap. And my brother was always kind of the mindset that, oh, we needed the same shit that all the other modern studios had. Right. We need, so there was always there was this big argument about JBL speakers and about this board. Right. And Pop was like, we don't need no fucking JBL speakers. You <laughs> <laughs> still make a good record. Yeah. Right? And, um, yeah, yeah. You know, and it was a little argument, and I was singing, and finally I go, hey, man, he's got more fucking gold records than we got. <laughs> he's got to know what he's yeah. talking about. <laughs> you know, um, well, it's also, you know, that's like being kids, you're young and you got to rebel. Yeah. You know, you got to be like, dad don't know what he's talking about. Yeah. And <laughs> and it's like the older I got. Um, so I did all that shit with like my rap and I had my rap career probably from starting in 87, but really 88 yeah. to about, to about 93. Mm -hmm. Uh and then we opened a club on Beale Street, Willie Mitchell's oh, right. on Beale. So yeah. I went and started out like busboying, and then <laughs> I was a waiter, and then I, I was a bouncer for most of the time, yeah. just from all kind of crazy training and shit. And uh, <laughs> and I was a bartender. And then I started being a manager and yeah. um, take you know like getting people to come in and perform. You know, like we did right. an Al Green concert. We had wow. like um, um, shit, Bobby Rush, Johnny Taylor, oh, yeah. Michael McDonald even <laughs> set in a couple of times. Uh -huh. Now it's from the Temptations. Wow. Yeah, it's all kind of shit. Is that venue still open? No, it's like, it's a coyote ugly now. Oh god! Uh, but we <laughs> well, had that's a downhill slide. Yeah. <laughs> so the studio and the club, it was kind of a cool thing. So yeah, I was at the club most of the time, and then I'd come to the studio, you know, after I would get off at like three in the morning and and do moonlight and shit. I I did <laughs> a couple of projects while the club was going on. I produced a record on this Japanese artist and. Uh, Pop ended up producing the rest of the guy. Like the guy liked a demo or something I did and wanted me to yeah. produce his record. Yeah. And um, so I wrote one song and stuff, and then it got too big, and I like turn it over to and like Pop ended up producing the rest. <laughs> he take this song. <laughs> it was like man, it's fucking JVC and people calling. Oh, I don't know what yeah. the fuck I can do with this. Weird, weird. Um, oh my god. So when we got rid of the club. Uh, which was like in 98, mm -hmm. I kind of, yeah, so yeah, by 99, I came back to the studio, but I was kind of doing, you know, odd shit, like helping people copyright their shit. Cause I had, to, I, for one split second of my life, I thought I wanted to be a lawyer. Yeah. So I studied, I started, you know, reading up on all the music law and trying to find yeah. out shit about cocker, you know. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I got, I knew enough to be dangerous, I guess. And, <laughs> you know, I would help guys set up their publishing company through right. BMI and, and I was kind of managing the studios. Like, fuck, man, we don't have a, a logo. I was like, we should have a logo. <laughs> you know, we got the Royal, it's just, yeah. Been out there on the building since 1939. So this is right. the Royal oh my God. Theater. Um, That's right. It right. comes from the theater. It yeah. doesn't come from the. Yeah. wasn't even an intentional name. No, it wasn't. <laughs> I it forgot was about that. Too. Yeah. I don't it know is, why. actually started out as the Shamrock Theater oh, fine. in 1915. And then I think by 39, it became the Royal Theater. Yeah. And stayed that. Man. Um, so, you know, I would, I would still. Uh, produce like some R and B projects mm -hmm. and shit that I like and some rap stuff and I you know, I made tracks yeah. and shit like that too. But I never yeah. really liked making tracks like <laughs> if I was in the mood I would do one, yeah. you know, but like if somebody hired me to do one, I'd never really liked that. Yeah. For some reason. It's it still if you have inspiration to make it. It's yeah, different it's than, different. It just yeah. n not you know, and I can make a track, it's just not the thing I like to do. Um, Archie was doing stuff in here too. Right? Yeah, Archie was, was making all the 
he was making most of the tracks and doing most yeah. of the well we had William Brown was mm -hmm. so William Brown started engineering for my dad like in 86 I think mm -hmm. And he had a long history with Stacks. Yeah, you know William that? was from the Mad Lads, and yeah, William right, like Lads. engineered all the fucking bar caves hits of the eighties, like no parking on the dance floor and oh, all nice. that shit. So William was like um, uh, this wizard dude that had like the eighties shit and a little yeah. bit of the seventies. Yeah, cut, you know the cutting yeah. the tape and shit. So right, right. When we started doing our rap stuff, William was actually engineering a lot of it. <clears throat> And he William tight grooves. And yeah, he would fucking cut. We do yeah. remixes on you know quarter inch. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, <laughs> cutting Chopping shit up. up. Yeah, but William had a stroke in two. William had a stroke at, at the beginning of two thousand and one. Yeah, and Pop still let him work for a few months, but it got it just got where because he he couldn't really his speech was kind of gone mm -hmm. but eventually his mind started yeah. kind of where digressing where he could was like yeah. no nah, this is like we can't have we, you know that's when we were out here it was right around then the first time and and scott bomar was like man there's just one guy but i don't think it, i don't think we can do the interview but he was but it would have been such a great yeah yeah, it would have been awesome. When he was better health, he would have been an amazing interview. Oh, my God, because right. that dude's got stories. Yeah. So my brother Archie started engineering yeah. from, you know, at the end of 2001, beginning of 2002. You know, he kind of became the head engineer, and I was just doing most of the business shit with, mm -hmm. um, with Pops, uh, you know, uh, when we got the deal with uh, when Al Green got the deal with Blue Note for right. uh, I Can't Stop and I was kind of like the project manager and trying to figure out what the union scale was now oh, yeah. you know and all that right stuff. right oh yeah and, uh, that was a nice comeback though. it, it was, was great man it gave, it, gave, it gave Willie a lot of acclaim too oh, because man. people realized that was the combination that made those hits in the past yeah yeah and it was a uh yeah, they really wrote some cool songs, and mm -hmm. I was just I was there for all of that shit. So, oh, wow. um, and my dad had some health issues too around two thousand. You know, had been in and out of the hospital, and that's really that's really when men like I always loved the man and looked up to him. But me and him started getting like really cool. I I guess a around 99 or 2000 because uh, I would pick him up. He wasn't driving anymore mm -hmm. and I would pick him up and take him to work every day and yeah. take him home at night. Yeah. And then somebody they put out a, a like a Best of Willie Mitchell record and I started I was like damn it, like Pop has some dope ass <laughs> instrumentals right? Oh yeah. So we would listen and it'd be shit he forgot about and <laughs> I started kind of picking his brain and asking him about, well, who's playing solo on that? And who's it, you know, right. like, oh, that's Fred Ford on that song. I'm like, really? Fred <laughs> Ford was in like, who wasn't in your band? Dude? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, At some point, everybody. Yeah. So I, it, he was like my best friend. And we, you know, and I just started asking him questions, you know? Um, so by the, by 2004, uh, they had did another, Al Green record after I Can't Stop and Everything right. is Okay. And this was, it must have been in the fall, I think, of 2004. And they were trying to put the record out, but they wanted You Are, they, they recut You Are So Beautiful and Blue Note wanted it remixed. Yeah. And my brother had kind of, had kind of disappeared and was off doing some other stuff and, yeah. um, I think he went out of town and didn't really say anything or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah, and, and my dad didn't know that he had went on vacation. And uh, so he was uh, sitting up. Pop was, like, pissed off, man, sitting at the front desk. And I was like, man, it's like, what's wrong, man? He goes, man, we got to remix this fucking record and you you 
brothers on vacation. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, it's not a big deal, dude. I was like, yeah. I know how to engineer and you got the best ear, so why don't yeah. me and you go, go back there and mix it? <laughs> and he just looked at me like, damn, that's a good idea. Let's do it. <laughs> he got a stick. <laughs> he got up. Yeah. And we went back here and I'm scared shitless, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what the fuck yeah. have I got myself into? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I'm like, okay. <laughs> now I gotta do a good job. <laughs> gonna go back in and fuck with this Sal Green record. Oh my god. And um <laughs> and we mixed it, man, and it came out and Blue Note loved it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And um it's like from that moment, it was the first time we like actually worked together. Um, the other times would yeah. be like me back here mixing somebody's stuff and everything sounds like shit. And I go up front and get him like, Pop, man, yeah. come, <laughs> come back here. I don't know what the, what And he'd it? come back and turn like two little knobs and it sounded like somebody pulled a blanket off of the mix. Yeah. And it always fascinated me. I was like, how in the fuck you... And it didn't matter if I was... Because I would do... Uh, you know, I would cut some rap and yeah. some R&B and some gospel and shit. Yeah. Just, you know, kind of on the side. And uh, he would always bail my ass out, you know? And, yeah. And it was the first time that me and him actually sat down and did something together. And from that moment on, I kind of became you know uh became his head engineer and it's like after that my the next thing we did was uh john mayer right you know wow. con continuum <laughs> so and like we didn't have pro tools i had oh that's right yeah i had built because i was on uh, my first dabbling <laughs> in a uh, digital recording I wanted to master, so I looked to see like what kind of PC could run Pro Tools, and I found something on like a Pro Tools message board, and I built the fucking PC oh, with yeah. RAID and no ASUS way. motherboard, all this shit. But oh, I man. put a new window on it, yeah. and I had this little Motu Twenty Four right. IO, and that fucking computer it still runs nah. now <laughs> with a single core processor. I just don't doubt it. And, uh, <laughs> So when John Meriden came in, we I recorded to the uh, you know I did everything to tape, and then yeah. I like backed it up <laughs> in the window. And, oh, that's a good idea. <laughs> yeah. So and then after that, it was like Buddy Guy. Yeah. Was this, was was Willie producing? Um, we... Steve Jordan was the producer. Oh, nice. On a lot of the stuff. And yeah, yeah. They had Pop doing horn arrangements and stuff. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. And. Uh, so he did a lot of the buddy, the buddy guy interaction with my dad. It's just like the most hilarious shit because <laughs> cause they were here for about a week, I think. Um, and I think, uh, God, what is his name? Don Smith? Engineer? Yeah. Yeah, good he engineer. He passed away? He did. Yeah. yeah. Don Smith, wow, what a dude. I heard he's kind of crazy. Absolutely. Out of, out of his yeah. mind. Yeah. <laughs> but he's like a fucking genius, man. Totally, dude. Right? So he was uh, he was engineering the buddy guy, and I was assisting, you know. And uh, so when it came time to do the horns, they were like, "Okay, boo, how do you do horns? <laughs> <laughs> Go do the fucking horns." Oh, that's and, funny. Um, but uh, Buddy and Pop would be would be having this like OG conversation, you know, yeah. two masters that have like been through <laughs> every fucking thing. Imagine and. Uh, so my friend Craig Brewer was working on this movie called Hustle and Flow. Mm -hmm. It yeah. all during that time period, and yeah. it came by to say hi to Buddy Guy. And uh, this is just a funny side story, but him and Buddy were talking, and and Buddy goes, "Man, I hadn't been to a, a movie since that movie uh, about the." He goes, "Hey Willie, what's the movie about the fish?" And then you hear Jaws. <laughs> Fish. How did he know that? How the fuck? Did he... <laughs> That's insane. 
<laughs> but anyway, so <laughs> Craig's like scratching his head. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, huh? the fuck are you two? And then like that pops down all jaws. <laughs> so, <coughs> oh man, you know, during this time, I'm like picking Pop's brain about every fucking thing. Like shit, I should have been asking him 20 years ago <laughs> when I was yeah. talking about the fucking speakers. Right. And uh, we get this call, uh, Solomon Burke. All right. The last time I saw Solomon was during this the Stacks 50th anniversary show mm-hmm. or grand open, whatever they did at the Orpheum. Right. And uh, I had met Solomon for the first time backstage yeah. and just stayed back there. I was like dropping somebody some fucking checks off from a session or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I just end up being kind of trapped. Yeah. There and just in then I ended up being yeah. backstage with Solomon like the whole vibe. Like I didn't leave. I wasn't yeah. even planning on going to the yeah. show. Oh my and, God. And, you know, we talked about him and Pop Cutting, but Solomon was signed to somebody and it didn't happen. Yeah. So 2008, fucking phone rings and the song, hey, boo. And I'm like, yes, sir. Yeah, <laughs> you sir. know. He was like, man, we're coming through there. Uh, Won't you get your dad and get get some musicians together and we're just going to cut some stuff. And I'm like, <laughs> okay. And I'm like, pop, man, Solomon wants to come. He's like, we don't have songs. I just called like all these badass musicians <laughs> like Lester, uh, yeah. Steve Potts, Lester Snell, Steve yeah. Potts, Dave yeah. Smith, all these dudes. Yeah. And uh, I'm like, man, just be here at six. I don't really know what the <laughs> fuck we're going to do. <laughs> oh my God. And, um, Solomon came through and they like wrote some shit and stayed a couple of days, you know, they, we got some cool shit out yeah. of it. And then after that initial little contact, uh, they spent about another month trying to figure out how to come back and like do it proper. Right. And they got it figured out. You know, right. pop was like, and Solomon just like went in on the thing and um wow. and we started cutting this fucking amazing record that ended up being like my graduation mm-hmm. record because like you know all the way up until then just even you know going back in the day I, I would always wonder like man what am I going to do if something ever happens to Pop if he's not here to bail my ass out? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, and, yeah, uh, yeah. And it always bothered me, man, like in the back of my mind because uh, I was so, de- you know, I was, I wasn't depending on like a crutch, but he was like my cushion, you know, yeah. my support. And because um, he could tell that I'd be trying to do shit to like, that would be pleasing in his eyes. You know? Right, right. Of course. And uh, <laughs> he goes, uh, he goes, man, when you're mixing, he said, man, when you're doing this shit, he was like, don't try to please me. He's like, I'm the only motherfucker in the world that can please me. You can't please me. <laughs> He's like, you got to please you. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, this like light bulb went off. You know, yeah, and he's basically kind of telling me like, you got to do what sounds good to you, man. You got right. this shit, you know. Yeah, and man, we mix that record like we were mixing like three or four songs. I had never mixed anything that fast. Like, <laughs> it was kind of at that moment I was like, okay, I think I might be able to do this shit, yeah. but I'm still wasn't, you know. Yeah, yeah. But I was like, I wouldn't. Uh, I wasn't so worried about it um, after then, and I just, yeah. I, he was just trying to get me to trust myself, you yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, totally. Uh, and that was like a profound, you know, moment in my engineering career, because you could what if anything, you know, it was yeah. a snare drum, too, you could fucking yeah. nitpick shit. Right. Oh, at some point, you got to make a decision and trust yourself, <laughs> you know? Totally. And then... Uh, Pop, he broke his hip. And we didn't even know it, you know. We just came in one day and it's like, man, I fell and blah, blah, blah. It's like, you know, get you to the hospital. No, man, I'm just sitting me up on the couch. And, you know, that shit went on for about two, a couple of weeks, you know. It's like, like, dude, we need to go to the doctor. And, you know, we went and uh, 
but they just see it diabetes and mm -hmm. it kind of snowballed and in the midst of all of that there's Rod Stewart wanted some oh, yeah. arrangements he wrote them and we cut them and then he went right back into the hospital you know oh, God. and uh, kind of got worse after that but uh, yeah sad days yeah were people kind of realizing that you were able to take over, take on the reins? And no, man, was it, was it, it, was it, it was, kind of hard? It was hard. I, yeah. I think all you know is what you feel, and I, yeah. I was kind of feeling like the word on the street was probably, oh, uh, yeah, it was Willie doing all this shit. Boo don't know what the fuck he's doing. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah, yeah. You know, and that's that's normal. I get that, and uh, you get a lot more years on you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you oh, know, man. there was. Um, yeah. A few people, you know, this dude from Spain that wanted my dad to do this record. He was like, well, you know, me and you'll do it. So yeah. did that guy's record, did a record on this lady, uh, Barbara Blue. Mm -hmm. uh, who's been singing on Beale Street for like 20-something years. At Silky's a real big voice. Yeah. Um, so, you know, these people that had talked to Pop about doing the record. And yeah. They trusted me to to do it, and we cut some really cool shit. And uh, I was working on Daring and Down's record oh, during yeah. that time that he passed. I think I was make I had cut it, but I was mixing it. And the first real, uh, you know, real major break was uh, Cody Dickinson, man. Oh yeah, right. So this was Pop had been had been passed away for about a year, and uh, Cody calls me. And he starts telling me about um, his taking to the river project, uh, yeah. would you know, and telling me about this guy because, like you say, the the D word, the documentary word right. in Memphis, and all the you clear the fucking all the major older musicians would just scatter, yeah, because there's been so many documentary, you know, there's been documentaries made, in on HBO and everybody got fucked like nobody got anything right and whoever made it got all the dough right you know so everybody I know all, yeah had a kind of bad taste in their yeah. mouth about documents so Cody's telling me about this cat Martin Shore and and this whole take me to the river thing and what he wants to do and you know he's um, putting older musicians with young musicians you know mm -hmm doing music in Memphis and Mississippi Delta. And he's, he said something to me and he goes, boo, he's trying to do the right thing. It like resonated. I was like, well, shit, I, I want to meet him, you know? Yeah. And I met Martin and we hit it off instantly. I'm like, this dude is at least as crazy as I am. <laughs> <laughs> but he's cool. You know what I mean? He was, uh, he wasn't trying to screw anybody over. Yeah. He's just like all his car, you know, it's like cars on the table. And, you know, during that call with Cody, I was like, well, who's, who do you want to produce it? And Cody was like, I want you to produce it. Yeah. And I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. you know, and then the next thing I know, um, you know, recording William Bell and Kurt mm -hmm. Whalem and Snoop Dogg and Bobby <laughs> Rush and, Frazier Boy and uh, Otis Clay, <laughs> wow, <laughs> you man, know, right. and, and Terrence Howard, you know, it was, yeah. um, that was a good, 2012 was a good, heavy year, you know, and, you know, I always say that Solomon Burt opened mm -hmm. the floodgates to Roy and, and, and blessed us because... Was that his final record? Right? Yeah, so yeah. from... Al Green's last thing from, you know, yeah. about 2006, five, six, seven were all weird for studios. I yeah. think there was a lot going yeah. out of business and shit, right. and the economy was all screwed up, and 08 hard. was hard. And Worse. then when Solomon came, man, it's like people started wanting to come to Royal again, yeah. you know? And, uh, and even after that, so then after Take Me to the River, the next thing I know, I'm I'm doing Wu Tang Clan's record, and uh, I think it was Bob Skaggs first. Yeah, yeah. You know, Steve Jordan had 
normally I only did overdubs here, you know, yeah. like um, horns, strings, keys, vocals, whatever. Mm -hmm. um, but Steve called and was like, man, we want to, we're coming down there to cut, we're going to track. I'm like, we tracking? <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> Better be ready. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And, uh, and him, him and Nico Bolas, he yeah. brought Nico with me. So it's like, I think my engineering skills, every time I work with some other badass dude, they yeah. they do like the Intel chip and they split and <laughs> I become twice as good instantly. Yeah. Just from what, you know, because the only way you're going to get better is to work with oh, yeah. motherfuckers that are better. When you really get to see someone implementing the subtleties of what, the, you yeah. know, of the, what this work is, and you see them making something sound better, boom. And Nico was like my confirmation. So Nico and yeah. Steve, they're like, all right, how did Willie get the Al Green drum sound? And I'm like, and they're fucking <laughs> gangster in my ass. And I'm like, all right, God damn it. Because yeah. <laughs> I knew, it's funny because I knew it, but yeah. I had never done it. Right. It's right. like, yeah, I know what he told me, right. but I never tried this yet. Right. And that was the first record. I was like, yeah. damn, that shit is, <laughs> it yeah, works. Man. Yeah, a lot of people kind of try to study it, but. It's, it's you have to kind of know it from the source. <laughs> yeah, well, you know. The other thing, too, is it's like yeah. folklore. Like, you do, you come up with new ways of doing stuff. Yeah, because it's all kind of rumors, but. Yeah. Yeah, no, yeah, there's. <laughs> shit. <laughs> no. It's hard to mimic everybody, yeah. you know. Yeah, so we got some guys coming in. Like. So yeah, it was on that session. Yeah, first time I tried the Al Green drum thing, I was like, it was wow. the three mics. Really, like, damn that shit. So I started incorporating that. Um, I remember doing the the strings. And he was like, we got strings coming. So I started micing the fucking strings, and Nico was going, "What in the fuck are you doing, man?" I'm like I'm liking the fucking strings and yeah. He 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 was just like shook his head and said okay. So they started playing. He was yeah. like holy shit and he called Al Schmidt. He was like Al, you're not gonna believe this. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! He was like you're not gonna believe this crazy shit. <laughs> How what you, what what's different in the technique? I just it's in the general just. Uh, my placement and yeah. selection and shit is just not, you know, it's no deck of tree. <laughs> no deck of tree. Good point. <laughs> and oh, I've man. even, and that was then, I've even altered my yeah. shit lately to kind of be more like pop with one fucking mic on the yeah. strings. Yeah. It, and it stays phase coherent. <laughs> yeah. You push the fader up, it does the job. Yeah. yeah. Believe me. Yeah, and even <laughs> horns too. I've um, wow. Because when the during the William Brown era, the music was kind of getting modern, and mm -hmm. Pop wasn't really using a lot of his uh, his OG yeah, techniques right. that he used in the seventies. Sure, he was letting William do his thing, and he, you know, he'd add some shit to whatever William was doing. And so I had kind of came from that. Uh, because I learned a lot from William Brown initially, because the eighties kind of engineering where you just taking shit away, you know, yeah, un -EQ and everything and yeah. all that shit. That's yeah. some, that's kind of how I learned initially, and I never liked my shit. Always fucking sucked to me. I never, <laughs> liked, you know, the little voice like fucking try it with no EQ, dude. Right, right. And I was like, whoa, that shit sounds better. And right. I used to try to gate my shit, and I remember when Pop was saving my ass on a mix one time. She was like, man, take all that shit off the toms. He was like, you get some of your drum sound from the fucking tom mics. Like, you yeah, got yeah. some snare and that shit. Right, right. And I was like, damn. So I stopped. So that's why yeah. all the gates are in the hallway. <laughs> and they've been, they haven't been there since oh my 2005. God. That's funny. Just put them away. Yeah. They're out there, someone really has to have them. <laughs> yeah, you know, and, uh, you know, the stuff I've managed to learn on my own is, like, implementing shit that Pop did, and then yeah. using, really, his his method and approach is, like, 
man, how does it fucking sound? Like, who, who gives a shit if it if it looks wrong, if it's textbook wrong? Yeah, does, yeah. What does it sound like? Yeah, <clears throat> it's always so much more You know, important. Oh, what does it feel like? That's, that's yeah. the other big lesson I learned from him. He was like, you know, uh, he was doing that Solomon thing. He was like, man, we're not selling music, man. We're selling feelings. Mm -hmm. right? He was like, man, don't be caught up in if shit is, uh, you know, some instrument may be out of tune or, you know, little mistake. How does it feel? How does yeah. it make you feel? You know? Yeah, so you've got to always ask that question. Yeah. He, he would be like, man, if you got a hit record, he's like, I, you can cut it in the bathroom on a cassette. <laughs> Good enough. <laughs> you know? And, yeah, and yeah. really, man, it, you know, uh, when the, I was working with Mark, when we started doing Uptown Funk, the vocal, we had Bruno in the vocal booth. Yeah. And all of us, like me, Cameron Whalen, his trombone player, Mark, Ronson, Jeff Basker, and mm -hmm. uh, this other dude, Philip Lawrence, and uh, and Bruno's engineer, we're all in here like jamming, and Bruno's <laughs> like, hey man, I want to come in there with you. And mom I'm like, oh shit, the fuck we gonna do now? So the only thing I could think to do was, because I did it earlier with Bobby Blue Bland, uh, one of his, his last recordings, we recorded with him on a 57 in here yeah. with somebody like telling him the fucking word right before he's supposed to sing it. Yeah. And that's the only thing I could think of, dude. It's yeah. like, he wants to do a vocal in control room. It's in 57. Yeah. You know, because it was like, you know, it's like five in the morning. Bruno's got an eight o'clock flight. Right. We got to get this shit, you know. Oh, and man. so oh, man. he does a couple in here killing everybody's having yeah, fun yeah. and shit. I'm just knowing they're going to replace this shit. Get a call a couple of weeks later from uh, Charles, the Bruno's engineer. It's like, man, so you know that vocal we did in the control room on the 57? I'm like, yeah, what about it? He's like, you know, we're keeping that shit. <laughs> so like, what? <laughs> oh my God. Wow. Cheapest mic in the fucking building. <laughs> <laughs> and it worked. It worked. Well, he's selling the good. song, isn't he? Yeah, because it's I mean, the fit. That yeah. is what. It's going to get the performance because yeah. you're trying to capture the fucking magic, man. Yeah. And, you know, that that's what was needed to put him in the zone. Um, and that record, I mean, that went nuts. And, and Mark and, and Jeff coming down here to work on that with you, was that was that kind of a turning point, too? For Yeah, that was another. Um, yeah, so when I, you know, uh, working with Steve Jordan on the Boss Gags record, yeah. And like, I was like, oh shit, I'm finna implement some of this Willie Mitchell, Al Green mic in all of my shit. Yeah. So my drum sound like went from okay to like a motherfucker overnight. <laughs> <laughs> and I did Wu-Tang Wu Clan after right, that. And right. then I'm like, they sound like they use my rough mixes <laughs> and wrapped over. And they keep it raw. Um, yeah. But yeah, so that... <laughs> Help like all my shit started, you know, sounding way about yeah. implementing a little of the OG mic in and uh and then when yeah, you know, Ronson and Jeff, man, that record, uh, yeah, it changed my life. It I knew it was it, it's so weird how stuff happens. Uh those dudes like came to town. I had, you know, been going through a lot of family shit and um it, that session like sometimes you know how you feeling like that you're trying to do the right thing and then shit's everything's coming out wrong and you just kind of yeah. feel defeated a little bit yeah you know yeah. but those dudes like came right when i was like you know feeling like man like am i doing like am i i'm yeah. I'm doing the best I can. Am I doing something wrong? Oh yeah. And uh, and they came through, man. In that session, uh, it's so ironic because I had, you know, they they came through looking for singers, and I didn't really know who they were. I obviously knew their work, but when yeah. the 
this person was telling me um, about them, uh, I didn't. I wasn't catching the names and shit. I was like, how do you spell that shit? I'm <laughs> trying to Google it, you know. Yeah, it's got someone said Jeff Basker there. Then I thought it was Jeff Baxter. Yeah, yeah I'm so like, I'm like what? To, and I was like, know. oh, back Jeff. Oh, the other Jeff. And, um, <laughs> you know, by the time, it, it's funny because the person that called me is this lady who was a former A&R, uh, not A&R, but a uh, program director yeah. for like the big clear channel stations oh, right. here. Yeah. And, you know, back in, the early 2000s, I had a little rap label with some rappers, and she never would play. She was like, I don't know, she was just mean. I don't hear it, you know. Yeah. yeah. She was just kind of, and uh, she's the one that called me about the session, oh <laughs> about God. them coming through. Oh, really? They, they were looking for singers. So that was another one yeah. of the phone calls. We were like, oh, shit. Ah, Why ah, is this ah. <laughs> Okay, yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> you still mad at me? <laughs> yeah, and she was so cool. She's like, hey, boo. She's like, I got these dudes coming to town, these producers, and they're yeah. looking for singers. So I called wow. a bunch of different singers. Wow. They came in, and they really um, they really freaked out about the studio for, yeah. Yeah. you know, about an hour. Wow. <laughs> and I remember Mark coming in here going, oh, I know that desk. I, I have one of those. I remember I read your dad had one, so I bought, bought one. one. <laughs> <laughs> um, That's funny. And so after, you know, they, like, listed people sing. And after they, uh, you know, Mark was like, hey, man, I think I want to make my album here. Yeah. And I was like, and I had got their names right by that time. And yeah. Google, I'm going, oh, shit, these yeah. dudes, like, two of the heaviest fucking dudes yeah. in the music industry. You right. Know? And I was like, okay. Mark's uh, agent called the next day and said, you know, we want to come in, you know, for like 10, 11 days and this time. And it was during the time that I had already had another session. Board, right. And the guy had paid me a deposit and shit. Oh, and it was like oh, a kind man. of, it was kind of like a, a kind of local, you know, famous Memphis songwriter, yeah. local hero. Yeah. Dude, you know, and he oh, had some man. guys coming in from out of town and, and man, so I like knew in my heart, in my spirit, that I had to do. I know this is going to change my life. I don't know why. I don't know yeah. what the fuck he's doing. Right. You know. And um, I had to call the Memphis dude and like, man, you know, I, I gotta move your session, man. He was like, man, I got people coming. I was like, dude, I will give you fucking free studio time it's, <laughs> just, it's something about yeah. this session I don't even know what it is but yeah. I know I got to fucking do it yeah yeah. you know and um, you know he went, he ended up doing it at another studio I gave him his deposit back whatever uh, yeah. and you know Mark showed up like a fucking week later with Steve Jordan and Willie Weeks and ah. Emil Heine and right. Kevin Parker and right. Homer Stein wise <laughs> Uh, trombone shorty. And <laughs> <laughs> sounds, sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. What are they all doing in a room? <laughs> and, and, um, and this Pulitzer Prize winning author named Michael Shabon who right? insisted on walking the neighborhood. And my mom goes, don't you take your ass back out there. It was like, oh, this is a lovely neighborhood. I was at the Sons of the Light motorcycle uh, club. <laughs> no way. Mark is so cool. So about day seven, Mark's like, hey, man, I got this song. I want Bruno to come here and record. He said, I'm gonna, let me play it for you. Yeah. And I'm, I'm going like, Mars? you know? Yeah. <laughs> and he played yeah. the Uptown Funk demo, and I was like, oh, shit. Yeah. That's going to be pretty cool. Yeah, they flew him in, and they yeah. didn't even have the song. It wasn't finished written. It was yeah. They had like a, a verse. Yeah. And part of the chorus, but they actually wrote the rest of the fucking song right there in that hallway. Oh my god. Um Wow. It's uh it was surreal, man. Like the it was like four in the morning and you know, they're like out of booze. I go and look at my dad's office and like next next to his Grammy yeah. is a like a one of one thousand bottle of this small batch four roses bourbon oh, like wow. signed by the master distiller Jeez. and shit and i just look at it and it was another one of those moments it was like damn 
Gonna have to take one for the team. <laughs> <laughs> So I yeah, grab the bottle and crack it open and I'm pouring it and Bruno's cup and goes, yeah, Boo Mitchell, man, fill my cup, put some liquor in it. And yeah. about 30 minutes later, that ended, <laughs> ended up in the song. Oh, that's right. <laughs> so, oh my God. just a whole fucking... That's hilarious, movie. man. Yeah, and Bruno's playing drums on it and shit. Yeah, yeah. Like, that buddy. Do this, man. man. I do this what kind of things happened after that? And I remember the fir- I remember the first time I heard that record on the radio was like yeah. in, in Memphis. A lot of times they'll play new music, and you know, like four in the morning or something. It's like always the time <laughs> yeah. I'm on the way home from the studio. So yeah, I yeah. Always hear the new shit. Yeah, yeah. And I remember hearing it on the radio for the first time and going, "Oh shit, damn, it's too long. <laughs> I'm not going to play it again." <laughs> you know? Oh my god! Because they hadn't edited. It. Right. At that point, it was like four and a half minutes or something. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was like, damn. You know. And <laughs> that, that was like November. And then, you know, I just hear it again. And by uh, January, man, you know, I remember somebody yeah. emailing me, like, your record's number one. I was like, yeah. It's <laughs> like, Big deal, I've fucking cut number one records before. <laughs> you know, I was like, okay. I was like, oh, listen, I wasn't like, you know, unappreciative about it, but it just, it was just like, oh yeah, Bob Skaggs record was number one on the blues charts right, and the rock right, chart. You know, right, it's like, right. okay, that's cool. And then another week, you know, shit started rolling. I was like, let me, it started just going nuts. And yeah. I like started looking, I was like, well, shit. Damn, it's number one on the fucking Hot 100. It's like, hmm. I don't think that's ever happened. Yeah, right. <laughs> and yeah. I start, you know, yeah. looking it up, and it's like Memphis hadn't had a record on the Hot 100 number one since Disco Duck. <laughs> <laughs> You're kidding me? No. Wow. It's fucking that's, Disco Duck, man. That's and, a weird thought. Yeah, and that's a pretty awful song. Yeah, and it started <laughs> getting like I remember. Um, it started getting like stupid, you know, just like you know, twelve weeks, thirteen weeks. Yeah, and yeah. people are calling me. They're you know, I'm on magazines in Memphis, <laughs> and you know, it's kind of surreal. And, yeah, and then the whole Grammy thing started happening. Everybody's like, I remember when the nominations came yeah. out. And, I remember getting up, checking the website, and I was like, huh, well, there's my fucking name. What does that mean? <laughs> and I called John, I'm like, John? Man, so I'm looking on the website, yeah. checking my shit, and man, my my name is like, on this record, I'm, I'm like, man, am, am I nominated? Does that make me, like, do I have to buy my tickets this year? <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> so the night of the Grammys, I, you know, how Lansky hooked me up with clothes. Oh, nice. With all this shit. Before I went, you know, he was like, man, can you go into Grammys? Blah, blah, blah. Come. Because he used to do my dad's clothes and Elvis. Oh, yeah, and yeah, Al Grammy. Good suits and stuff. Yeah, man. man. Yeah. Uh, so I, I went and wow. uh, got lansky up. And <laughs> I, I had my dad, I was going, I was all, I had all my Lansky shit and I was going to wear the jacket and stuff and I was like man I think I'm gonna wear my dad's leather jacket mm. you know yeah um because from my childhood that was a jacket that he wore all yeah. the time when I was growing up and he had given it to me in god man probably 2007 <coughs> yeah. or something and I never fucking wore it right. right you know what I mean and uh I was like oh, I'm gonna wear this jacket and yeah, I still had my Lansky shirt and all my other shit. And I just remember, they, you know, I was like, I don't know if we were going on stage or not. And the you other engineers and yeah. everybody's like kind of scared. I'm like, well, I don't work for any of these guys. <laughs> I don't know what y'all are going to do. But if I hear Boo Mitchell, my ass is going on stage. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening. Find us online at tapeop.com. 
Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Until next time. <laughs>